We all have our eyes on the ultimate goal, the biggest prize, Al Firdaus, right? It's the highest level of Jannah. In it, what no eyes have seen, no ears have heard, and no human has ever imagined. Well, what exactly do we have to do to attain this lofty and honorable level? Now, Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, said that if we were to ask for paradise, we should ask for its highest level, Al Firdaus Al A'la. But why? He, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, said. Paradise has 100 gates, each of which is as big as the distance between heaven and earth. The highest of them is Firdaus, and the best of them is Firdaus. The throne is above Firdaus, and from it spring forth the rivers of paradise. If you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, ask Him for Firdaus. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't discriminate between people. He extends his gifts to literally anybody who seeks. This is not limited to men or women, black or white, or the rich or poor. Al Firdaus is open to all those who seek. If they work on the six tasks on the to-do list required to attain it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says most certainly those believers have attained true success they who are during their prayer humbly submissive and they who turn away from ill speech and they who are observant of zakah and they who guard their private parts except from their wives or those their right hands possess for indeed they will not be blamed. But whoever seeks beyond that, then those are the transgressors. And they who are to their trusts and their promises attentive, and they who carefully maintain their prayers, those are the inheritors who will inherit Al Firdaus. They will abide therein eternally. We will discuss what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says is required to attain al-firdaus in detail one achieving khushu that is concentration and humility in our prayer they who are doing their prayer humbly submissive having khushu means to be present in the prayer enjoy the prayer realize you're speaking to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala this is about the quality of the conversation we're having with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How would you feel if you're having a conversation with someone and they're not listening or focusing or being attentive and are distracted? Is this the conversation deepening the bond between the two of you? Of course not. Well, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to have a quality conversation with Him. In conversations, we listen then we speak. That's what we're meant to do in the salah. We listen to the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we're reciting. Then we speak to Him and make dua, asking for everything and anything that we need. How to achieve khushu'a? One, listen and internalize the words you're uttering in prayer. Be present with Allah by truly sensing and experiencing the words you're reciting in prayer. Two, Make sure you're reciting Surah Al-Fatiha correctly. If we recite and reflect on the Fatiha properly, it'll transform the prayer experience completely. The Fatiha truly unlocks the hearts and reflects the genuine needs of every human being. It reminds us of our destination, our needs, and our fears, all in the seven verses. It makes all the difference if we're truly present while saying to Allah, it is you alone we worship, and you alone we ask for help. Guide us to the straight path. 
We're always making choices and decisions in life. Always. Every day in prayer, when we remember that we come from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and our final destination is to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then when we tell Him to guide us to the most perfect way, which is the best choice and the best decision, we then truly put matters in perspective and learn how to rely and bond with our Creator. Five times a day, we do that with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Five times a day, we tell Him, guide us to show us which way to go. But if we're not really listening, if we're not paying attention, and if we're distracted, then we'll miss the point and we'll miss the destination. Three, always, always make dua during, after your prayer. It is a dialogue between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One hadith mentions, let one of you ask his Lord for his every need, even until he asks him for the strap of his sandal when it breaks. Four, diversify the surahs you use in prayer. We need to enter into the world of the Quran. This will help us be present and enter into the mood of the prayer. The feeling that we get when we recite Surah al duha is not the same feeling we get when we recite Surah Taqweer and not the same feeling we get when we recite Surah Al-A'la, for example. I remember one particular prayer that truly affected me the most. There were certain circumstances that were happening around me. And at the beginning of the prayer, for some reason, a particular surah came to mind. So I began to recite that surah. I realized how each ayah was describing the circumstances we were living in. As if like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was listening, seeing, and responding directly to what's happening. Subhanallah. I was reciting words that explained my inner feelings as well as what I was witnessing externally. It felt so real. So let us memorize more of the short surahs, at least with their tafsir, so we can understand fully what we're saying and experience it. The more we know from the Quran, the more we'll allow Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to speak to us. Five, confined to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala like how you can find to your best friend. I have a friend who told me that whenever anything good or bad happens, she rushes to prayer to tell Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to complain, cry, ask for help and guidance. She says Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the only one who was there during the entire situation and knows it fully inside out. She says, I don't need to call a friend and explain everything from the beginning. She may or may not get me. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala already gets what I mean and He saw everything. Allahu Akbar. So let us rush to prayer like we rush to tell a friend about our day and about our problems. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to say about prayer, O Bilal, call iqama for prayer. Give us comfort by it. We get comfort when we pour our hearts out and tell everything to a close friend. It is like a great conversation that you don't want to end. That's what we need to do with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah is the ally of those who believe. He brings them out from darkness into light. Let us enter into the prayer so that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would bring us out of darkness of our lives and problems into His light. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the light. Number two turning away from useless speech and activities. Anything that is meaningless, unproductive, and doesn't help in achieving our purpose in life, including slandering, backbiting, lying, cursing, and swearing, and inappropriate deeds. Why? Because lago is major corruption and harm to the self, others, and the society at large. It is a waste of time and a huge distraction from one's ultimate goal. We lose sight of our destination, get absorbed in useless matters, and eventually get lost. The Prophet ﷺ said, A sign of a man's good observance of Islam is to keep away from that which does not concern him. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about the believers, and when they pass near ill speech, they pass by with dignity. And about those who completely lost their way, that they used to enter into vain discourse with those who engage in it. Try not to engage, dwell, and get absorbed in that which is meaningless and useless. Is this conversation or activity gonna benefit me in my deen, in dunya? If not, simply cut it short. Keep going and stay away from it as much as you can. Remember, we have a more important goal to achieve. Have the intention to make your activities more meaningful. The correct intention can make any deed that is not a sin into a reward. For example, if you're spending a lot of time learning about beauty and makeup, then at least have the intention that this is to beautify yourself for your husband and increase the bond between the spouses, which is a great act of worship. If you can't help but spend time playing games, ones which are pure, not any that involve immorality or anything inappropriate or in the gym, then at least take the niya intention that you're refreshing so you can focus on more important tasks or that you're working on your health so you can be strong enough for your worship and your duties towards your family. Basically, put mind into action. Put some thinking and mindfulness to be in control of what you engage in and not let it control and swallow you and your life away. Number three, engaging in purification of the self and wealth and they who are observant of zakah. Zakah, almsgiving, is prescribed to us to purify our wealth. But this ayah refers to self-purification as well. We all have flaws in our character and our personalities, anger, bad temper, narcissism, jealousy, the need to lower the gaze, gossiping, etc. We all know ourselves. So how to actively purify the self? Number one, pick one or two aspects about yourself that you want to change. Write them down or even make a mental note. Then start working on them as they occur. At yourself when committing those bad habits. Take a deep breath and then leave it for the sake of Allah, for the sake of your destination. Al-Firdaus. Keep reminding yourself of this. I'm leaving this for Him subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'm leaving this for our firdaus The reward is definitely better and more lasting than the momentary satisfaction you experience. Unfollow social media pages that don't help you purify yourself. This might be difficult, but you can do it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and do not pursue that of which you have no knowledge. Indeed, the hearing, the sight, and the heart about all those one will be questioned. There are many social media pages and platforms that involve a lot of immorality. Let's be honest, they might be funny or inspiring, but deep down, you know that they have some corrupt content as well. Immoral or indecent images, language or insinuations, etc. If we continue to expose our eyes, minds and hearts to impure materials, how then are we supposed to purify ourselves? Cut this out. You won't lose anything. Instead, you'll notice so much purity, light, serene, and peace entering your mind, heart, and life instead. Four, guarding our chastity, and they who guard their private parts. I want to mention one observation here. The need for this action is obvious. It is basically avoid engaging in sexual activities outside the marital relationship because marriage provides full rights and a sense of settlement and security to both partners. It goes without saying that anything less than marriage is truly not befitting for men or women, for anyone to dedicate themselves, their precious emotions, time, thinking and physical being to someone who is not committed and can leave at any point. This is not fair or right. It reminded me of the sisters who post images of celebrities on social media with the hashtag goals, 
relationship goals or hashtag future husband. Billah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah An Nur, tell the believing men to reduce some of their vision and guard their private parts. That is purer for them. Indeed, Allah is acquainted with what they do. And tell the believing women to reduce some of their vision and guard their private parts. So it starts with a look that isn't guarded properly and ends up as an act of impurity. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us instructions to find deep pleasure in the relationship between a husband and wife. The more we purify our gaze, the more we will enjoy our spouses. The look is something sacred and precious. And if it's put in the right place, it'll bring fulfillment to the heart and even count as an act of worship and vice versa. If it's put in the wrong place, it'll increase the sense of emptiness and deprivation in the heart and increase the sins. Five, honoring our words, trusts, and promises. And they who are to their trusts and their promises attentive. How many times do we hear the event will start at 6 p.m. only for it to end up starting at 9.30 p.m.? How many times do we say we'll be there at a certain time and show up late? How many times do we break our words, our trusts, and our promises? What we don't realize is the word is extremely sacred in Islam and to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Remember the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was known as Al-Ameen, the honest, the trustworthy, before he was known as the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. How can we be honest and trustworthy people? Set your intention firmly and have the mindset to work on being the one person at home, in class, at work, etc. that everybody can confidently trust and rely on. Just think twice before you make a promise. If you know you can't keep it, or if there's a chance you won't be able to commit to it, then inform the people involved immediately. They'll appreciate your honesty. Don't let them count on you. Then break your trust. Be truthful when you make a promise. And be truthful if you can't keep it. Six, maintaining our prayers on time. And they who carefully maintain their prayers. Have you noticed that the list started with prayer and ended with prayer? It started with the quality of each prayer and ended with instructions on maintaining all prayers carefully as well. Praying all prayers on time and avoiding delay is one of the most beloved deeds to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu an asked Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam what one of the best deeds to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was. And he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam replied, establishing prayer on time, making the conscious effort to pray on time and with concentration will inevitably help with all the other tasks on our to-do list. It'll aid us in leaving useless talk, in purifying our souls in our wealth, in guarding our chastity, and keeping our promises and our words to people. For example, one would feel rather hypocritical to respond to the call of prayer on time, but show up late to other appointments. It also won't feel natural to carefully recite the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that put life in perspective then engage in absolutely useless activities. Getting the prayer right will inevitably make everything right. Remember that the last words which the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam spoke were prayer, prayer. Fear Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala about those whom your right hands possesses. He Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam warned us to guard our prayer. And if we do so, and we're conscious of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then we won't abuse anything or anyone whom we're entrusted with. So remember your creator, and then you'll be merciful towards his creation. Let us also remember that the salah is the first thing we will be asked about on the day of judgment. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, the first of man's deeds for which he will be called to account on the day of resurrection will be salat. If it is found to be perfect, he will be safe and successful. But if it is incomplete, he will be unfortunate and a loser. If any shortcoming is found in the obligatory salat, 
the glorious and exalted Rabb will command to see whether his slaves has offered any voluntary salat, so that the obligatory salat may be made up by it. Then the rest of his actions will be treated in the same manner. So how to help perfect our salat? Number one, maintain the sunnah prayers. The sunnah prayers, that is sunnah before and or after fard prayers and nawafil prayers, complement any shortcomings in our obligatory prayers. The Prophet ﷺ said, whoever persists in performing 12 raka'at from the sunnah, a house will be built for him in paradise. That is four before the dhuhr, two raka'at after dhuhr, two raka'at after maghrib, two raka'at after the isha, and two raka'at before fajr. Number two, pray in the first hour. The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was asked, which of the actions is best? He replied, observing prayer early in its period. And here are final reflections. One, you may look at this list and think, I can never do that. I can never be that person. However, the very first ayah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned after this list is, and certainly did we create man from an extract of clay. He mentioned that we were created from clay or mud. What is that? That is something that can be shaped and molded. It is in a rock. It is flexible. We can't be defeatist and think that we can never purify ourselves because it is simply not true. Of course you can. We all can. It's our very own nature to mold, shape, and develop our characters. Two, there is another very important observation in the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has used the Arabic language in these verses. The first ayah started with the past tense, qad aflaha. Most certainly, those believers have attained true success. The list then present the tasks we need to do in present. Continuous tense, fa'ilun, working on purification. Yuhafidun, maintaining the prayers. Mu'ridun, staying away from useless activities. This shows that if we're working on what is instructed in these verses, if we are sincerely and persistently engaged in this process, then we have already succeeded in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is as if you're running and the coach is looking at you and saying, you've already won. You're still running. But he's so encouraging and appreciative of your efforts to him. The effort itself is a true success. This is very generous of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Imagine also studying all semester. Then on the night of the exam, you get very sick. You achieve very badly as a result. Thus your effort goes to waste. But with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there is no effort that goes to waste. Indeed, Allah does not allow to be lost the reward of those who do good. So we should never give up as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is guarding and recording every effort. And Allah is the best guardian and He is the most merciful of the merciful. Number three, remember that to-do list is not limited to black or white, men or women, the rich or poor. It is not limited to any particular race, gender, social status, or lineage. Any human being can work and achieve the best. You may be superior to someone else by worldly standards, but they in fact may be much more successful than you in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is a path that eliminates sexism, racism, classism, and any ism. There is no superiority in Islam of one person over the other, except by righteousness, taqwa. O mankind, indeed, we have created you from male and female and made you peoples and tribes that you may know one another. Indeed, the most noble of you in the sight of Allah is the most righteous of you. Indeed, Allah is knowing and acquainted. Finally, note how earning the highest paradise involves deep connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, bettering oneself and benefiting others. This is not a path of selfishness. 
or isolation. This is a path of self-purification, benefit of people, and deep bonding with the Creator. So what yet causes you to deny the deen? Is not Allah the most just of judges? This was taken from ProductiveMuslim.com and it was written by Dina Muhammad Bashioni.